Hey folks, welcome back. This is module number one, uh, part one for CSE 1300. And today we're gonna talk about the different parts that make up a computer and how they work together and how computers effectively work. Um, so we mentioned in the last lecture that computers are just everywhere. They're in microwaves, televisions, TVs, cars, every smart devices, your laptop, your phone, these are all computers. All of these devices have a few parts that are in common. And so we're gonna look at the pieces that make up a computer. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the case. The case is what holds the computer together. And it doesn't seem like a particularly important part, but it actually serves a couple of different purposes. So if you have a desktop computer at home um, where you have a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse and you have a desktop of some form, it probably looks something like what I just circled over there on the right. It may be something that stands upright like that one, or it may be something that lays down on the table. It certainly could be bigger or smaller. They come in all different shapes and sizes. But there are a couple of common things that you will find on these. There's going to be a power button that's going to be somewhere right in there. You might have some optical drives like Blu-ray drives or DVD drives that will be up towards the top. On the back, your power cord generally plugs in right there. You're going to see some kind of a fan right there. There's a whole bunch of plugs that you're going to plug everything into right there. And then there's some expansion cards where you plug other things into right there. So this is a pretty typical uh, desktop computer that you might be using at home. Um, and beyond that, you may be using a laptop. A laptop looks kind of similar to this, except obviously it has a built-in keyboard and monitor. And all of the same ports that we were talking about over here, they tend to be on the laptop for all the ones that um, aren't inherent. Like there's no need to plug a monitor into a laptop. So typically there isn't a monitor port or maybe there is if you have an extra one. All right, so that's what a desktop computer looks like. That's what a home computer generally looks like. If you work in a business, you're gonna be looking at something more like this, which is a server. This is one example of a server. Um, servers are generally measured in height. And this particular server, what I mean by that is from here to here is generally considered um, this particular one is a 1U server. And that means it's about an inch, inch and a half tall. And the reason that we talk about U in um, servers is because typically in a business, they would rack a lot of servers into a rack. And so what you would end up with is a rack that might look something like this. And inside of the rack, you would have up to 42 computers that are stacked on top of each other. Each of these is 1U. And so you could put 42 of these guys into that cabinet. And the main reason for doing that is because businesses tend to keep servers inside of a data center. And a data center is a building that's specifically designed to keep the power running, to keep the servers safe and cool so that they can run. So they're specialty buildings that are built or renovated to hold servers rather than hold people. Generally, the ambient temperature is going to be quite cold in the building. Um, and that's to pull a lot of the heat away from the computer. It allows you to stack the computers much more densely so that you can get a lot more computing power in there. This is not the only example of a server. There are certainly, this is a 1U, there are 2U servers, which is going to be double this height, 4U, which is four times the height, um, and so on and so forth. And there are other types of enclosures that you might run across. You might find something, for example, that's a 4U server. So its height is 4U. But inside of it, you might be able to put 10 computers um, that are vertical inside of that for you. And so that puts it even more dense. So over the years, they've changed the form factor. They don't all look exactly like this. But just to be aware that computers that are used in business tend to be more servers and computers that are used at home tend to be more desktops. But no matter what, each of these has a number of things in common, which is that the case is basically there to protect all of the internal components. So the components that make up a computer are actually quite fragile. If you were to bend them in any way, they'll tend to break. Um, you're probably familiar with this from your phone. If you drop your phone, it's hit and miss as to whether the phone continues to work. Beyond the, even the screen breaking, some of the internal components may stop functioning as well. So the purpose of the case is to protect the internal stuff. For the record, your phone also generally has a case, not the thing that you snapped on, but there's an actual physical form factor that you bought originally as the phone, which has all of the information um, or all of the components neatly uh, enclosed inside of it. So first purpose of the case is to protect the internal components from damage, from falling, from moisture, and also from static electricity. 
So those last two things, when you bought your phone, they probably told you that it was IP65 rated or IP67 rated, or maybe it was IP12 rated. And those numbers tell you how much dust and how much water or moisture the phone is able to deal with. Typically, servers have no, no such rating because it's assumed that they are in a room that is protected and is not dusty and has no water or moisture in it. So if any moisture gets on the component, it's going to pretty much die. Um, so static electricity is the other problem. If you drag your feet across carpet and you've ever touched something and you got a shock from it, you have discharged some static electricity out of your body. Unfortunately, if you do that to an electronic component, there's a pretty good chance you're going to blow the component because they're not designed to handle the amount of electricity that flows out of your finger when that circumstance happens. So one of the purposes of the, of the case is to protect the internal components from getting electricity of any form except where it's supposed to go through the charging port or whatnot. So one purpose of a case is to protect all of the internal components from moisture, from static electricity, from dropping and falling, and just keep them all protected neatly. The second reason for the case is a lot of the components inside the computer produce a lot of heat. The power supply, the CPU, the GPU, all of these things produce a lot of heat, and we're going to look at those in a moment as to what they are. But one thing that the case does is it's used to dissipate all of that heat and get it away from the components, because if the components get too hot, they will fail. So generally, if you look at the back of a desktop computer, one of the things that I mentioned here was the fan, and that's this part right here. So that fan, its purpose is to blow air continuously out of the case. And on the front of the case, there's probably going to be a grill somewhere where there's an intake area where air can flow in to ultimately be blown out. And that has the purpose of cooling the internal components of the computer. Uh, this is why if you put your hand behind your desktop computer, you'll feel warm air. Um, your phone, on the other hand, doesn't have a fan built in. Generally, it's done through a mechanism called passive cooling. And what that means is rather than having an active fan that is cooling it, it's cooled based on the idea that the entire case is designed to remove heat off of it. So the surface area of the phone actually pulls some of the heat off of the components. Um, and so passive cooling, it's not as effective as active cooling because it cannot do as much, but it is a way for components that are not producing as much heat to dissipate their heat. So either active cooling means fans, or it can mean water cooling. There is such a thing as water cooling that's sometimes used, but usually it's fans. So all of this is to get heat out of the case. So let's talk about the parts that are inside the case. Every computer in one way or another has a power supply. And the reason for this is because ultimately, what comes out of your wall outlet, when you plug something into a wall socket, you're getting 110 volts AC assuming that you're in the United States. Um, 110 volts AC is not what all of the internal components in your computer work on. Most of them work on either 3 volts, 5 volts, or 12 volts DC. So in order to convert from AC to DC, you need an electronic component that does that, and that component is going to be called a power supply. So the power supply is generally going to look like this guy, and it's made up of a few parts. Usually the power supply has its own fan. That's what that big hole on the top is for. And again, it's to blow air out. It turns out converting from AC to DC and changing voltages produces a lot of heat. So actually the power supply ends up being one of the major producers of heat inside the case. And so its purpose of the fan is to pull some of that heat out to allow those components to function correctly. Coming out of the uh, power supply, you're gonna see a big bundle of wires. And if you open up your back of your computer at home, you'll find that out of the back of this power supply, there's going to be just a pile of wires. And these wires go all over the case. There's going to be some things that are plugged into the motherboard, which we'll see that in a moment. There's going to be other things plugged into the storage um, devices that you may have in there. There may be some cables plugged into your GPU. And the reason for this is because each one of these connectors that's on the ends of these wires, they go to different places. Each connector can only go into one hole. It's kind of foolproof. It stops you from plugging in the wrong voltage into the wrong component. So all storage devices use one voltage. All motherboards generally have two or three different voltages that come in that are used on a specific connector. So if the connector fits, most likely it is the correct connector for there. So that's what the power supply does, convert stuff over. This is what a power supply in a desktop looks like. If you're talking about a phone, a laptop, or a tablet, the power supply is probably going to look something like this. Either you're going to have 
a big brick that goes into the wall and has a power cord coming out of it, or you're going to have a power cord that goes into the wall that leads to the brick, and then on the other end of the brick, there's a cable that plugs into your computer or your laptop. Nowadays, most, most laptops, most phones, most tablets all run off of USB power. And so actually what these guys are doing is they're just producing USB power. We'll talk about USB in a little while, but effectively USB is just a standard way of plugging a bunch of stuff in. And one of the things it can do is to be a power supply. So let's talk about the different amount of power that goes into things. When you purchased your phone, it probably came with a little brick that is plugged into the bottom of the phone via a USB port, or maybe it's a lightning port or something like that. And that power supply is what's charging your phone, which because there's a battery inside your phone or inside your laptop, power has to be sent in to charge that. So different power supplies that you can use with your phone or your laptop actually produce different amounts of power. And what that means is your device will charge faster on some power supplies and slower on others. And the way that you can look at that is most power supplies are going to probably tell you how many watts they produce. And so you might have a two watt power supply or you may have a 20 watt or a 200 watt power supply. And the difference is how much power that power supply is able to provide to the device. A formula that you probably should remember is this formula, which is normally abbreviated as W equals VA. So watts is equal to volts times amps. If you take something that plugs into an external power source, like something in your house, a power outlet, the voltage is going to be 110. That's how much in the US we send to household outlets. And so if you were to take something like a 200 watt um, light bulb, which those are hard to find these days, but let's imagine you have a, a 10 watt power uh, light bulb, then the question is how many amps does that draw? Well, you can do some math in here. And so A is going to be equal to W divided by V because you can subtract that out. And so if we were to take a calculator here and we were to take um, 110 and divide it by, there we go, took a moment to start up, 110 divided by, um, I think I said a 10 watt light bulb. Uh, oh, I did that backwards. Let's do that again. 10 divided by 110 uh, would be a 0 0.09 amp draw. And so the reason this is useful is because if you plug too many things into your power outlet, you can pop a breaker in your house. Um, and that's probably happened to you if you've ever plugged in something like um, a little space heater or a hair dryer or even a like a stove top, you know, like something to, to cook things in. And that's because anything that produces heat like that, hair dryers and um, all of those types of things, they use a lot of power. And so your general circuit at home is usually a 15 amp or a 20 amp circuit. And so you just have to be careful about how many amps you're actually drawing on it. Because when you hit that threshold, that's when your circuit breaker is going to pop. So all of that is to say, you should be familiar with the formula W equals VA. It's a useful formula in life. And it tells you how much power something is drawing if you know two of the three parameters. You can convert from watts to amps, you can convert from amps to watts, as long as you know the voltage, and so on and so forth. So again, today, most matter, modern laptops, most modern phones and tablets are all going to use a power supply that looks like that, that's going to be outside of the device. And that's partially because if you think about how big the power supply is on your phone, it's probably half the size of your phone. And you'd have to increase the phone thickness in order to fit the power supply in, which would be terrible. So that's why we keep it as a separate external device nowadays um, in order to do the charging in a more neat way. Um, it is the case, however, that these guys also produce power, um, sorry, produce heat. So if you ever notice while your phone is charging, the brick that's doing this conversion, whether it's in the middle of the power cord or whether it's in the wall, um, it's actually usually quite warm as it's charging. And again, that's because all power supplies produce some amount of heat. Okay, so next up inside your device, beyond the power supply in the case, we're going to talk about the central processing unit or the CPU. A CPU is the device that does most of the actual intelligence inside of your computer. A CPU is a small little chip, and we're going to take a look at a picture of one over here on the right. It's usually about an inch square. This particular one is an Intel chip. And on one side of it, you're just going to have this metal top um, where it has its name. On the other side of it, you're going to have 
thousands of little connectors or pins that are plugging into something else. And so that's generally what it looks like. What does it do? Well, power supply or CPUs are generally made by one of a handful of companies. Um, probably the largest two that you've heard of are probably Intel and AMD. Intel and AMD manufacture most of the CPUs that are in desktop computers, that are in servers for businesses. Um, they are one of the largest manufacturers, each of them. They're two separate companies. They're each independently one of the larger processors manufacturers. The third one on here you've probably not heard of is ARM. And the reason you haven't heard of it is because it's not one company. ARM specifies how a processor can be made and it's a specification, and then lots of people make them. It is quite likely that your phone, your tablet, maybe your laptop are running ARM processors. And certainly almost everything else in your house is as well. And what I mean by that is your TV, if it's a smart TV, which it probably is, has an ARM processor in it. So ARM processors are actually a lot more ubiquitous than the Intel and the AMD ones. It's just that nobody really knows of them as ARM. You may know it of it as a Qualcomm or as a Samsung chip or as a number of other um, chip names that are running an ARM standard. All right, so the processors are made by these folks, and then we talk about what's inside of a processor. So inside of that little one inch chip, there's actually going to be a couple of different parts. There is a clock in there, and I don't mean something that tells you that it's 2 p.m., I mean a clock that just ticks time. Think more like a metronome, uh, if you've ever had to learn music, something that goes So a clock is just marking time. The clock inside of your CPU probably runs at a really fast speed. As a matter of fact, it's one of the things that you learned when you purchased the CPU. On the box of the CPU, it will tell you the clock speed. And generally, that clock speed nowadays is going to be somewhere between 2 gigahertz and maybe 3.8 gigahertz, maybe a slightly above 4 gigahertz if it's a real fancy one. So that means that the, a hertz means something that happens every second. So if you have something that's running at 2 gigahertz, then effectively what it's doing is it the clock is ticking 2 billion times per second. Okay, now you might wonder what does this have to do with the CPU? Well, each one of those clock ticks is how fast the CPU can process an instruction. And what I mean by that is you could ask the CPU to add two numbers and it will be able to do that in one clock tick, which means that the CPU would be able to do it in one two billionth of a second or to phrase it another way, it can do 2 billion additions per second if it is a 2 gigahertz processor. If it's a 3 gigahertz processor, it can do 3 billion per second. If it's a 4 gigahertz processor, it can do 4 billion per second. So that's why the clock is important. The next two parts working up from the bottom are the registers and the cache. These are places inside the CPU that it can store information. For example, if I need the CPU to add two numbers, I want it to add 7 and 10 then I have to first tell it seven and then tell it 10 and then tell it to add the two. So what I do is I put seven into one register, 10 into another register, and then I tell the CPU I need to add those two registers. It then produces a result, which will be 17, that it puts into yet another register, and then I pull the answer out of that other register. So a register is basically just a storage place where you can put information into the CPU temporarily. The information is generally only in there for a clock cycle or two. It's usually not stored in there long term. The cache is kind of a similar idea, but it's slightly different. The cache is an area where if the CPU is being asked to do the same operation over and over again, it will just remember the answer rather than having to go recalculate it. This is kind of hap this happens in your world as well. If you try to navigate somewhere that you've never been before, you're probably going to use Google Maps or Apple Maps or whatever else, and you're going to navigate there. And if you go there three or four times, eventually you don't need the map anymore because you know how to get there. And that effectively means you've stored the answer in your cache. And so the next time that you say, well, how do I get to this building or how do I get to this location? You simply just go there because you already have the answer. The CPU does the same thing. If you ask it to multiply 2,814 by 17,312, it calculates it once and it stores it in the cache. And then if anybody asks that exact same question again, it already knows the answer and doesn't have to go recalculate it. So those are two little storage areas where the CPU can remember things as it's running. Next up, we have the control unit. And this is part of the brain of the CPU. It's basically the part that talks about how the CPU is going to go about solving problems. 
And then finally at the top, we have the arithmetic and logic unit or the ALU. The arithmetic and logic unit is responsible for doing most of the arithmetic, hence its name, and most of the logical deduction. And what I mean by that is, and we're going to see this later on, figuring out if things can be anded together or ORed together or not, and all of those things will make a little bit more sense as we go forward. So the ALU can do math. It can do pluses and minuses and multiplies and divides and some other math functions as well. And it's, it's really a big, important part of the CPU. So those are the various bits that make up a CPU. Um, and as I said, that's kind of what a CPU looks like. So let's talk about how this works at a very high level. Each of these little metal um, surfaces that you can see right here, and it's really hard to point to one because it's so small, but each one of those little surfaces is a pin or a connector in one way. And that pin is effectively a wire. So if you were to um, want to, you could effectively draw the CPU as having all of these wires hanging off of it going to each one of those little connectors. And you can see that there are just hundreds of them on here. They're really, really small. And each one of those wires is a way to communicate in or out of the CPU. And so to take my previous example, if I wanted to add 7 and 10, what might happen, and this is not the exact pin layout of this CPU, I'm just giving an example, what might happen is I might send a signal in on the first, let's say, eight wires that has the number 7 in it, and then into another eight wires up here, I might send the number 10, and then down here on maybe 10 wires, I might say that I needed to do an add. And then finally out of here on another eight wires, I'll get my answer, which is going to be 17, of course. And so that's really how it works. So what do I mean by sending information into the CPU? Well, all computers just work on power. So it's a question of is the power turned on or is it turned off? And so in each one of these wires, I can send power to it or not send power to it. If I don't send power, the CPU thinks of that as a zero. If I do send power, the CPU thinks of it as a one. And so effectively, if I want to communicate the number seven to the CPU, I have to convert it into zeros and ones. And we're going to see how to do that a little bit later on. And then if I want to tell the CPU to add, I'm actually just going to figure out according to Intel specifications, since this is an Intel chip, what particular instruction I want an add to be. And so there's some number, 72 is the add instruction. And so I will send 72 to that set of pins, and the CPU says, oh, I understand you want to add what's over here and here, and it returns back um, a number again in ones and zeros on this other side. And so that's basically how a CPU works. It just has a bunch of pins. Some of those pins are used to send information in, some of those pins are used to get information back out, and some of those pins are used to tell the CPU what it is that you want the CPU to do for you. So that is how the CPU works. Let's talk about, here we go, the arithmetic and logic unit. So how does it actually work? Well, as I mentioned, when I send in a bunch of information, I'm going to send it in in a binary number. I have to convert everything that we know, like 7 and 10, into binary. Once they're in binary, I'm going to send them into the CPU, and I'm going to ask the CPU to do the add instruction. And so the control unit understands that that's what you're asking for. It asks the ALU to do the operation. The ALU gets an answer. It stores it back in a register, and then you pull the information back out of the register. And magically, you have a device that can add. So as I mentioned, each CPU is purchased at a particular clock speed. And so you might have purchased a 3.2 gigahertz CPU. And when again, that means it's capable of doing 3.2 billion operations per second. Um, over time, that CPU has gotten faster and faster. If we think back to the last lecture, in there I showed you a computer from the mid 80s or the early 80s that was a one megahertz processor. And that meant it could do a million operations a second. Well, if we talk about today, we're doing 3.2 billion operations per second. This is way, way, way faster than that older computer. And so over time, we have figured out how to make the processor run faster and faster and faster. But the reality is at some point, about mm, probably eight or nine years ago, we kind of hit a wall on that. There's a certain physical limitation, which is usually related to the speed of light, which is pretty much the speed that stuff moves, that you can't really go much faster than that inside of a CPU. And so in reality, the CPU speeds went from one megahertz 
up to 3.2, 3.8, maybe 4.1, 4.2, but they've never really gotten much past 4 gigahertz. You'll see occasional CPUs that do a little faster than that, but it's not consistent and it's not large numbers of them. And again, it's a physical limitation. So once we hit that point, there was really no way to make processors faster, but while well, there's still a desire to have more capable computers. So what they did was they figured out how to shrink down the size of the CPU, and that's done by making smaller and smaller components. As they started to do that, the original one inch square CPU, well, they had shrunk it all the way down to a half an inch square, which meant that, well, you could put two of them on a single one inch processor. And so what they did was that's exactly what they did. They, instead of having one CPU in one chip, they put two CPUs in one chip and they call them cores, core one and core two. Each core runs at whatever speed it runs at, 3.2 gigahertz, and each core can do 3.2 billion operations per second. And so when you purchased your phone, you've nowadays probably purchased a two core or a four core processor that probably runs at 1.2 or 2.5 gigahertz, depending on how fancy the phone is. And that means that it cannot do 1.2 gigahertz, uh, 1.2 billion operations. Because it has two cores, it can actually do 2.4 billion operations. So after they got two CPUs in one core, they then figured out how to, or in one chip, they figured out how to get four CPUs or four cores into one chip, and then eight cores, and then 16 cores, and then 32 cores, and you can buy up to a 100 core CPU at this point, although it gets way more expensive the more cores that there are. And effectively, that means that that CPU is capable of doing four times, eight times, 16 times the amount of work that a single core CPU is able to do. So that's our CPU. The next thing that we're going to talk about inside the computer is the RAM or the random access memory. Every computer is going to have this. In most cases, it's going to look something similar to the chip that we have over here on the right hand side. The exact shape of that chip varies a little bit. If you're in a laptop, it's going to be about half the size, so it's going to be more like this size. But if you're in a server or a desktop, it's going to pretty much look like it's pictured. If you're in a phone, they just solder these chips directly onto the board and they're not serviceable. What I mean by that is on your desktop, if you were to open up your case, you'd actually see these chips inside of there and you can remove them and you can replace them with other chips. That's true in servers and in desktops. It's usually true in laptops. There's usually an access panel somewhere underneath your laptop where you can pop out the chips and put new chips in there if you want to. And you might wonder, well, why would you do that? Okay, so let's talk about the purpose of the RAM. Basically, as your computer is working, it needs a place to be able to store a lot of information. All of this applications that you're running, such as Chrome or Firefox or Safari or Edge, that's a web browser, and Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or Excel, those are various word processors and, and whatnot, um, or a game or anything else that you're running, each of those things is a computer program. And the computer program actually has to be stored in memory in order for it to be able to run. So it has to load the entire program into memory and then run it. In addition, anything that that program needs also has to be stored in memory. So right now I'm recording this video on my computer and there's a camera that's obviously capturing my face down here in this little box. And there's a microphone hanging here that's recording my voice. In addition to that, I'm showing you a PowerPoint presentation. All of that is being stored in memory. And then there's a process that's running that's converting that into a video where it's showing all of that. And that video is also being stored in memory as it is producing it. Eventually, it's writing it out to the storage. So there's a big difference between RAM and storage. When you bought your phone, your laptop, your computer, they gave you two different numbers. There was the amount of RAM that it has and the amount of storage that it has. The storage number is typically much bigger. So the storage number might have been 500 gigabytes, a terabyte, two terabytes, five terabytes, maybe even 10 terabytes. Whereas the RAM number was probably four gigabytes, eight gigabytes, maybe 16 gigabytes. Usually you don't have much more than that. So why are there two different things and what's the purpose of each? The RAM, the one we're talking about here, only stores information while the computer is turned on. And what I mean by that is if you pull the power plug and you disconnect or turn off your computer, everything that's stored in RAM is lost immediately. There is no way to get back to it. So 
RAM is volatile. It's only there while the computer is booted up. The storage device, which we'll look at in a moment, is not volatile. It's able to remember information even when the computer is turned off. As a matter of fact, you can take the storage device out of one machine and put it in another and all the data will transfer with it. So they have very different purposes. RAM is much faster. It's easier to put information in and take it out, whereas the storage device is going to be slower than the RAM. So there are advantages to each. If you're wondering why you would ever maybe need to change the RAM in your computer, when you bought your computer, you probably bought something with four gigs or maybe eight gigs of RAM. Those would be very common sizes for most computers. And what that means is the computer can think about four gigs worth of stuff at any given moment. The problem is some things like your web browser, Safari or Chrome or Firefox or Edge or whichever one you're using, they probably use about a gigabyte of storage of, sorry, of RAM just to open them. And so as you access more and more web pages and you have more and more tabs open, it has to remember all of that stuff in RAM. Every web page that you've looked at, every video that's running, every video game that's being processed in the background, all of that is consuming RAM. And so when you run out of RAM, the computer doesn't shut down or, or break or anything like that, but it does get a lot slower because the only option it has is to take the things it doesn't think you need right now out of RAM and put them into the much slower storage and then pull things back from storage into RAM as you access them. And so the experience that you have as a user is that the computer will be fine and run great until you open a bunch of stuff. And when you open a bunch of stuff, all of a sudden it slows down. That means you've run out of RAM. And so that will be the circumstance where you might want to go buy more RAM and upgrade the computer. So it's not going to make the computer faster per se, but it allows the computer to do more things simultaneously and therefore be able to keep more things open and whatnot. And so that's why you might eventually need to upgrade the RAM in your computer. Okay, so the RAM, the CPU, and the power supply are the three things we've talked about inside the case so far. The fourth thing that's inside your case is called a motherboard. And this is an example of a motherboard. This particular one is made by a company called MSI. There's lots of different manufacturers that make them. There's Gigabit, there's Acer, a Asus, a whole bunch of other people make motherboards. So this is just one example, but they're all gonna look somewhat similar to this. There's a couple of key parts of this that I'd like to point out. So right up here that I'm circling, this is the port that the CPU connects into. The CPU, as we mentioned, is about a square inch, so that gives you proportions as to how big this is. And effectively, down in this bottom corner here that I'm highlighting now, there's a little lever. And when you pull that lever and pull it open, this black connector on the top is going to lift off, and it's going to reveal a whole bunch of pins that are down here. And so underneath your CPU, there's a bunch of pins that connect from the CPU onto the motherboard. Now, I will tell you that if you're deciding to go open up your computer at home, just so that you don't get into too much trouble, I would strongly recommend that you do not remove the CPU out of here. And the reason is because the pins that are in the CPU are incredibly delicate. They are very, very thin. And if you wiggle it in just the wrong way, you actually can break the pins and make it so that it will no longer work. Um, so putting a CPU in here is something you can do, but you need to be very careful when you do it. It's not something you can quickly look at and put back in. So inside of this port, if I were to draw it out, it probably looks something like this. It's gonna have square edges on three sides, but it's going to have a cutout edge on the fourth side. And this cutout edge that I have down here is to tell you which way to orient the CPU, because again, it's a square, but it only connects one way. So if you ever buy a new CPU and place it on a motherboard, what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at the CPU in your hand very carefully to find that cutoff corner, and then when you go to the motherboard, you're going to look on the motherboard for the same cutoff corner. You're going to place the CPU carefully over the pins and just release it in to make a connection. And then you're not going to twist it or wiggle it or do anything else because that's going to break pins. So just be super careful. It is absolutely doable. You just have to be very, very delicate as you're doing it when you place the CPU in there. Once it's in, you're going to take that um, same lever that's down at the bottom down here and you're going to lock it down, which holds the CPU in against all of the pins. Typically on top of your CPU, you're going to have, um, so if this is your CPU here, let's draw it in some kind of three-dimensional way. There we go. So that's your CPU and it's connected onto your motherboard. 
above the CPU, there's going to be a large heat sink. And this is a metal bunch of fins that connect on the top and bottom to the CPU. Usually there's some CPU goo, which goes on the bottom of the heat sink above the CPU. And then above all of this, there is going to be usually a fan. And the reason for that is because the CPU is the other thing that produces the majority of the heat on your computer. And so this fan runs above the cooling fins and it pulls heat off of the CPU and throws it away so that the outer fan of the case can blow it out of the case. So all of this is to get heat from the CPU out of the case. And the, the heat sink just is used to pull the heat quickly off of the CPU and allow the fan to blow air over it. So usually if you put a new CPU into a computer, it'll come with a new heat sink and a new fan, and the fan will plug into the motherboard. There's uh, probably somewhere like right around, um, let me do yellow again, somewhere right around up here, that's probably a port that you plug the fan into. It might be this one. It's actually quite hard to see because that's such a small picture, but somewhere on there, there's going to be a little port that the fan plugs into that's on top of the CPU. All right, so the CPU plugs in to the motherboard. The second thing that plugs into the motherboard is the RAM that we were talking about, and that's what this area over here is for. The RAM has, in this motherboard, four slots that you can put chips into, and the chips are almost always going to be placed in in pairs. So if you upgrade the RAM, you're going to buy DIMMs, that's what they're called, and the DIMMs will be 2 gig DIMMs or 4 gig DIMMs or 8 gig DIMMs. If you wanted to get the machine to 8 gigs, you would buy two 4 gig DIMMs, and you would place one in one slot and one in another slot. It will tell you on the motherboard which slots to put them in. And if you put them in the wrong slot, the motherboard will just beep at you when you turn it on to tell you that something is wrong with your memory. So that's where the RAM goes. It's usually in those slots. If you have four slots like this one does, you could conceivably put four four gig DIMMs in here and you would have 16 gigs of RAM available. So that's how you can do upgrades. CP, uh, motherboards on desktop computers and servers will tend to have four maybe eight or 16 and servers uh, slots for DIMMs, your motherboard on your um, laptop will probably only have two slots. And so unfortunately on a laptop, both slots will be occupied. You'll have to pull those chips out and probably throw them away and put new chips in that are of the higher capacity that you want. Okay, so the motherboard has the CPU. It has the memory which is uh, known as the RAM. And then beyond that, there's gonna be a lot of connectors on here. Down in this area, down towards the bottom here, there's a whole bunch of um, pins that are sticking up and they're gonna plug into the case. On the front of your case, there's probably a bunch of lights that tell you that the computer is on and there's a reset button and a power button and all of those are gonna connect into pins on the side. And then other devices like storage devices are gonna plug in down over here most likely. And then on the front of the um, motherboard, which is probably this area over here, all of the ports that you're gonna plug other things into that are outside of the case are going to be right there. So what I mean by that is if we go back to our picture of the case that we saw earlier, if you actually look at this now, the motherboard would be here mounted on the side of the case inside, obviously. And then this area right here are those uh, ports that we were just looking at on the side of, this, of the motherboard. And your monitor, your keyboard, your mouse, your network cards, all of those things are going to plug into those ports, which are plugging directly into ports that are on the motherboard, all right? So that's where the CPU and the motherboard live. All right, the other thing that plugs into that motherboard is the power supply. And honestly, on this particular picture, again, it's small enough on my screen, I can't really tell, but there's gonna be a bunch of ports. This is probably a couple of them, and there's usually one somewhere in the middle, it might be right here that's dark, where all of the power supply leads are gonna plug in. Um, the power supply generally plugs into two, maybe three different ports on the motherboard to provide different voltages to different things. So that's how all the power comes in. So on the outside, you have an AC cord that goes into the power supply. Inside the power supply, you have all those leads, Many of them are going to connect into the motherboard that powers the CPU, the RAM, and all the ports that are on the front, like the USB ports and stuff. And then there's other leads that plug into the storage devices, which we'll look at here in a moment. All right, so that's the motherboard. Again, if you have a laptop or a desktop, it's going to have one that looks pretty much like this in there somewhere. If you're dealing with a phone, it's the same kind of idea, 
but some of the chips are going to be soldered directly onto the phone. Phones are generally not considered user serviceable, meaning you generally can't open the phone and change out the RAM or change out the CPU. They're meant to be purchased as a single device and effectively recycled or thrown away when you're done with them. They're not meant to be upgradable. Whereas desktops and laptops are meant to be more upgradable because they realize they'll be around for longer. All right, so next up inside the case, we're going to talk about the graphics processing unit or the GPU. So we talked about the CPU, which was the central processing unit. The GPU is the graphics processing unit. So the reason that these two things are different is because they're just specialized chips for doing different things. It turns out all of the graphics that you've seen on your computer where you have like a character running across the screen in a game, that character has to be drawn by the computer. And the way that it's drawn is through a whole bunch of math. If you remember back to Algebra 2, you probably looked at matrices and matrix multiplication, matrix addition, matrix inversions. All of that is what has to be done in order to render graphics. It turns out graphics is a lot of matrix multiplications and additions and other stuff like that. So it's very, very, very math intensive. And while you could do all of that on the CPU, over time they realized that it was burdening the CPU so much that everything else on the machine was slowing down. So for the more graphical intensive tasks, they decided to add a specialty chip that just does the graphics code or the graphics multiplications and mathematics. And that chip is called the graphics processing unit or the GPU. And it's usually on a card called a graphics card. So anytime that you are watching a video, whether you're on Netflix or Disney Plus or any of the other streaming services, the rendering of the video is going to be done by your GPU. If you're doing any kind of 3D modeling, like you're doing something in Blender or you're using AutoCAD or anything like that, where you're doing something where you're able to see an object on the screen in three dimensions, that's going to use your GPU. And probably the thing that you use the most is anytime you play a game on your computer, that's going to use the GPU as well. So all of this is heavy math and it's built onto this GPU chip. So what does a graphics card look like or a GPU? Well, here's an example of one on the right. They all look slightly different from each other, but effectively you're going to have a card that plugs in. There's going to be a set of connectors down here on the bottom and it plugs into the motherboard. And then this part of it here is exposed to the outside of the case. And it usually has the ports where you're going to plug in all of your monitors. So if you have a monitor that plugs in either with HDMI, DVI, SDI, display port, all of those are going to go into the side of the graphics card and that part is exposed outside the case. And then the rest of it is there's a circuit board that has a whole bunch of fans to keep it cool. It's quite commonly the case that there's a plug where the power supply sends specific power to the GPU because they tend to be power hogs as well. So this GPU and any GPU that's like it or any graphics card that's like it is very, very capable of doing a lot of math. And specifically, while the CPU can do all kinds of things, the GPU really is only designed to do a specific set of instructions. And what I mean by that is your CPU might be able to do, let's say, 100 instructions. There's 100 different operations it can do, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. It might have 100 different things. But your GPU may only have 30. Those 30 things that it's capable of doing, however, are much higher level things. Like, here's a matrix and a matrix. I need you to multiply them. That might be one operation. So the GPU is going to have a smaller instruction set, but it's going to be much higher level instructions that it's able to carry out to speed up the processing. And one of the things that happened with GPUs is rather than trying to make them go faster and faster, they really embraced the multi-core thing. Because it turns out a lot of times you have many different objects on the screen that need to all be rendered at the same moment. And so each of them can be rendered independently on its own processor. So a typical graphics card will have thousands of cores as opposed to a CPU, which will have tens of cores or, you know, four, eight cores in that number. So GPUs have lots of very specific cores that are capable of processing a lot of stuff in parallel. They do generate a lot of heat. So the three things generating heat are your power supply, your CPU, and your GPU. They produce almost all of the heat that you have to dissipate inside the case. And so those are the ones that are going to have the fans on them. You do have a graphics card inside of your phone as well, but it's usually just a, a specific chip that is soldered on the board next to the CPU. Some CPU manufacturers have actually integrated the GPU directly into the CPU, 
and you actually can buy a CPU that has the graphics components built in. Usually those components are not as capable as an external graphics card. So if you're looking to play the latest WYSIBANG game, you're probably going to need to go buy a new, nice graphics card for that. The graphics card, again, plugs into a slot on the motherboard and it is replaceable. So on your desktop computer at home, you can pop out the old graphics card and put it in. On desktops, yes. On laptops, rarely can you replace it. It's usually built in and on phones, never can it be replaced. The final footnote I'll mention about graphics cards is because they're very good at doing math, it turns out that some folks uh, found other uses for them. And so uh, another thing that is very math intensive is any kind of cryptography, which is encrypting information, decrypting information, or looking for specific types of information and trying to work through a whole bunch of encrypted things to find something. If you're familiar with cryptocurrencies like um, Bitcoin or anything like that, there is a topic in cryptocurrencies called uh, mining, where you're trying to make new coins. And that effectively means you're trying to solve a very complex math problem or look for a solution to a very complex math problem, which is a whole bunch of cryptography. And so people use GPUs because they have so many cores, they can parallelize checking lots and lots of different keys to try and bit mine. And so in recent years, it's been harder and harder to find graphics cards because folks have been using them for Bitcoin mining in one way or another. All right, so next up inside of your device, you have a storage device. So the storage device is what stores information when you turn the computer off. And storage devices tend to be much larger than the RAM. As I said, your RAM is probably eight gigs. You wouldn't be able to buy an eight gig storage device. They don't exist. Probably the smallest you're gonna find now is a 128 gig or maybe a 256 or 512 gig. But usually you're gonna be talking in half a terabyte or larger for most devices that you're gonna buy these days. So your computer probably has a 500 gig hard drive or a terabyte hard drive or something along those lines. Storage devices come in a couple of different formats. The oldest format is this bottom one down here. Um, this is a spinning hard drive. And what I mean by that is inside of that physical enclosure, there is a motor that's spinning a disc um, usually 7,200 times per second, um, 7,200 times per minute, sorry, um, RPM. So it's usually going to be spinning at a reasonable speed in there. And that platter, which is what it's called, is just a circular disc that's spinning. If you've ever seen a vinyl record or a CD, it works very similar to that, except it's magnetic. And so the head that reads and writes from it is able to push magnetic information on or take magnetic information off at a reasonable speed and transmit that back to the computer. So when you save a file, if you open up Word and you type a Word document and you hit save, what's happening is it's being converted into ones and zeros and then they're being written onto the platter around as this spins. So spinning media is the older format and it is probably still one of the more common ones, especially for the larger sizes. There's a reasonable chance that when you bought your laptop, it might have had a spinning disk inside of it. They're great and they're very reliable, but they do have two major drawbacks. If you shake your laptop a lot, especially while it's running, the head will hit the platter as the platter is moving around, and it may leave dents in the platter or make it so that it is not usable. And so over time, they'll start having errors when they try to read information back in because of those dints and bangs that have happened on the, on the platter. The second problem is anytime you have something that's spinning, eventually it will stop spinning. Um, motors wear out. They can only really run for a few years. In the best case scenario, a spinning disc like this will last about five or seven years. Sometimes they only last two or three years, just depends on how hot they get and how good the bearings are and how reliable the motor is and so on and so forth. So it's very important when you save information on a computer that you back it up onto another disk and not just store it on one, but keep it in two different places so that if one fails, you didn't lose all of your information. Or you can back it up onto the cloud into like an iCloud or a Google Drive or a Dropbox or something like that so that you're storing it somewhere else as well as locally on your computer. So just keep that in mind. All right, so this is the oldest type of um, storage, and this is usually referred to as a hard disk drive or an HDD. Um, 
And so the newer versions are going to be, this is called an SDD, uh, sorry, an SSD. I don't know why I said SDD. Um, this is a solid state drive. And uh, this top one up here is going to be an NVMe uh, drive, uh, which is sometimes called a um, M. So it'll be M.4, M.5, something along those lines. All right, so each of these allow you to store information on um, long term. The difference between the top two and the bottom one is that the bottom one has spinning parts in it, whereas the top one is a special type of RAM that doesn't lose information when it is powered down. So information is stored solidly, hence the name solid state, and it is not. it doesn't require a power supply in order to keep that. Generally, these top two devices are going to be more expensive per gigabyte than the bottom one. The bottom one is going to be a lot cheaper. So if you take a look at these three random pictures that I have, this bottom one is listed as a four terabyte drive, whereas this middle one is a 500 gigabyte drive. So effectively, this one is eight times larger than the one above it. And the one above that, I can't read it because it's too small, but it's probably also a smaller size. Generally, the solid state ones, the MVMEs, uh, are usually going to be a terabyte or less. It is possible to get bigger ones, but they're still quite expensive. So if you have one in your computer, you probably have less storage if you have one of the top ones. However, the advantage is they are way faster. Probably the quickest way to de decide whether you have an SSD or not is when you turn on your computer, from the moment you hit the power button to the moment that it is usable, like you can actually log in and start using it, how long does that take? If the answer is it's about three to five, maybe seven seconds, you most likely have an SSD or an MVME. If the min if it is a minute, then you most likely have a spinning drive. So it's a measure of how quickly you can pull information off of the storage in order to be able to get the computer what it needs. Opening a large file, working with video files like I am right now, any of those things are going to work much faster if you're running on an SSD or an NVMe type situation rather than on a spinning drive. Again, all these parts are interchangeable on your computer. So in your desktop computer at home or in your laptop, this part can be pulled out and replaced and you can speed up dramatically the use of your computer in that regard. Okay, so beyond all the things that we've talked about, there are lots of other things that might exist inside of your computer. If we're dealing with something like a phone or a laptop or a tablet, you're probably going to have a battery inside of there. Um, as a matter of fact, of the physical form factor of your phone, the battery probably occupies about a third of that size. And that's what stores power and allows you to use the phone without having it plugged in. The same thing is true on your tablet or on your laptop. Some big portion of it is just batteries. Um, you may have a network card. The network card allows your computer to talk to other computers. And so either physically you plug a wire in, that's going to be an ethernet port, or you talk Wi-Fi to other computers, and that's going to be a chip that can communicate with a Wi-Fi network. Or you might have a 4G or 5G chip inside of your phone, inside of your tablet, sometimes inside of laptops, that allows you to work even when you're not on Wi-Fi. And those are extra chips or cards that can be added to your device. Your device may have GPS, NFC, or Bluetooth. These are generally on phones. You have a GPS chip in here which can listen to signals from satellites and estimate where on Earth you are to within 10 feet. You can have NFC, which is what allows you to tap your phone to pay. It also allows you to sometimes um, use transit systems and other stuff like that. So NFC is something where the phone has to be physically up against another um, machine in order to actually transmit data. And then Bluetooth is what allows you to talk to your earbuds, allows you to communicate with your watch if you have a smartwatch. Anything that's within a couple of feet of the phone or the tablet can communicate via Bluetooth. So it's a shorter range communication system. Sound cards allow you to plug headphones and earbuds in to your uh, phone, your laptop, your computer. Um, they come in different varieties and different capabilities. If you're recording music or you're doing something like that, you might need a higher end one. Most computers come with a basic one that allows you to listen to music or a movie or whatever else. Um, connectivity ports. On the back of your computer, you probably have a bunch of ports that you can plug things into. Depending on the type of computer, Mac, Windows, Linux, you'll have different ports back there. But nowadays, most everybody is moving towards USB, which we're going to talk about in a few moments here. But you may also have serial ports and specialized ports.
You may have cameras, microphones, sensors uh, for different things like gyroscopes, which tell you if the phone's being moved or what direction it's pointed in. Temperature, which obviously tells you the temperature. You might have heartbeat sensors, especially in watches. Um, you might have speed and accelerometers. Your phone can actually tell how quickly it's moving and how quickly it's accelerating and how many Gs it's experiencing. Those are all just sensors that are built in. Um, they're usually soldered onto the motherboard or whatever. You may have RAID cards. This is more in servers. This allows you to have multiple storage devices plugged into one server, and it'll store information on many of them simultaneously to speed up access or to give you redundancy so that it's automatically saving it in two or three places. And then you certainly could have optical drives, like if you're uh, able to play a DVD or a Blu-ray um, on your computer, that's an optical drive. So as I mentioned before, your computer generates a lot of heat. That's produced by the power supply. It's produced by the CPU and the graphics. If your computer overheats, it gets too hot, you will damage some of the components in there. So an important part of the computer is running the fans at the right speed. While the fans are noisy, they do move a lot of air. And so you've probably noticed on your computer, your laptop, if you run a lot of stuff together, you might hear the fans speeding up and you're going and you'll hear the computer generally trying to work to get that heat out of there. Um, so that's just part of the design of the, C of the motherboard where it's keeping track of everything, what temperature everything is and trying to keep it cool. Using metal instead of plastic is a great way of helping to get um, uh, heat out because metal will transfer heat a lot better than plastic will. And that's one of the reasons why sometimes you'll pay a premium for a metal case of some form. All right, so let's talk about the different things that you can plug into your computer. All computers are going to have a power cord. Generally, it's going to be a 110 volt AC power cord for your desktops and your servers. Uh, sometimes servers run at 208 volts. Um, and then your laptops, your phones, your tablets, those are usually going to have some kind of converter that gives them DC power. It's also possible that you could have wireless charging. A lot of phones and tablets and earbuds support wireless charging where you're sitting on top of a magnet and the magnet is transferring power that way. Most devices nowadays plug into your computer using a USB port. So USB can plug in mice, keyboards, printers, scanners, headphones, cameras, mics, flash drives, game controllers, even LEDs and decorations and Christmas lights and all kinds of crazy things. So a USB port, there are many different formats for USB, but today, if you are starting something new, you'll probably want to use a USB-C port. That is the new standard that everybody's supposed to be moving towards. But you certainly on your computer probably still have a USB-A port or a super speed USB-A, which will have the little blue down at the bottom. You might also have seen a USB-B that's typically used on printers and scanners and things like that that are older. You'll see that shape. These are all just different shaped ports that have different capabilities. They're able to move different amounts of power, different amounts of signal and whatnot in and out of the computer. So the USB port is an external port that just allows you to connect stuff to the computer. USB can provide power, either send power into the device or take power out of the device. So you can plug your phone into your laptop and the battery in your laptop will actually charge the battery in your phone. Theoretically, you could do it the other way as well. Um, they can also power things like lights and fans. It's quite common to deck out your case with LED lights and all kinds of other things. And all of that's usually powered off of the USB bus. Um, they can also be used to send signals. So in order for the USB port to be useful for you know headphones, these headphones and this microphone that I'm talking on, are all sending through USB into this computer. There's a USB-C port on the end that the connector is plugged into. And so all of this audio is being sent over USB, um, cameras, videos, all of that kind of stuff is usually sent over USB as well. Beyond USB, there are other ways that you can hook up things. And so yet generally for connecting a monitor to your machine, you're probably going to use a HDMI cable. Um, HDMI is generally what you use at home as well to your TV. If you've got a game system or anything like that, it probably plugged in with an HDMI port. There's also other standards. DVI is a slightly older standard. DisplayPort is another standard. And VGA is a really older standard. So that completes our discussion on how a computer is put together, what all of the components are that make up a computer, and how things can plug into a computer from outside. In our next lecture, we're going to talk about how computers are able to talk to each other and basically how the internet works, uh, at least from a very high level. So I will see you guys then. Take care.